Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Ion Connect. This state-of-the-art co-working space and tech lab helps grow innovative ideas to commercialization and market launch. Our speaker is Marlon Dahl. Marlon is the founder and lead video strategist of Vireo, of Vireo Video Marketing. That's a tough one to say. Just have a beer when you try and say that. <laughs> I'll start again. Our speaker is Marlon Dahl. Marlon is the founder and lead video strategist of Vireo Video Marketing. At Vireo Video, Marlon and his team specialize in video advertising on YouTube and Facebook organic video SEO optimization, and implementing strategic growth and conversion campaigns with both native video and branded content. Vancouver Business Network, members and guests, I invite you now to put your hands together and give Marlon Dahl a warm, warm BBN. Okay, I'm excited to get into this. We got a lot of content to get through. Uh, it might be information overload, but uh, you can ask questions in between and I'll try and address as much as I can. Um, or you can hit me up after and ask anything you want. So, this is what we're going to learn. We are going to learn how to optimize your YouTube channel, how to optimize individual videos, how to create a YouTube ad that converts, so actually generate sales. It's not just for brand awareness. We are going to learn a bit about setting up a YouTube ad campaign, um, how to generate a four to one return on ad spend as well. And we're gonna ignore that last point. So who am I teaching you guys? So I am the founder of Vireo Video, as Roger said. Uh, we think it's a great alliteration, but I didn't realize how hard it was to say. Uh, and I founded this three years ago. So I was working at the world's largest YouTube network broadband TV. There we had 85,000 different YouTube partners and it was my job to help them grow and to manage them and, and to consult with them, uh, mostly in music channels. So I got to work with channels like World Star Hip Hop and Major Lazer, which was the first independent music channel to hit 1 billion views on a video. Um, so I got to work with a lot of big brands and I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm teaching these creators. I don't currently have my own channel. I should probably have that so I can, you know, practice what I preach and put some of the things I had been learning into action. I had channels in the past, um, but I wasn't currently doing that. And so I started this cooking show called Bachelor on a Budget. And it was to teach people how to make healthy food affordably. And uh, pretty quickly, I had some great success, like my first 5,000 subscribers in six months. And so someone asked me to do a talk on how, how I got my first 5,000 subscribers. And I actually did that, and that actually led to getting a uh, consultancy because they wanted to, someone there wanted to learn how, uh, how to do that for their own channel. And so that led to, hey, I should probably try and get some more uh, clients to help, to help these guys out um, outside of my normal nine to five. And that led to staying up till 2 a.m. every night trying to do that, and my nine to five and the cooking show. And I was like, okay, this is, we got to go full time here. So I did that about three years ago, and uh, now we've been working with some awesome brands. Uh, here's some of the fun brands that we've got to work with. Um, also do regular uh, speaking engagements, like I spoke at SAP, which is third largest software company in the world, uh, Best Buy Canada. Um, yeah, regularly speaking at different conferences, and so um, yeah, excited to get into some of this stuff with you guys. So we're gonna break it up into, first we're gonna talk about the organic side, YouTube marketing, and then we're gonna talk about the YouTube advertising side. So first off, why YouTube? Uh, we got a bunch of buzzwords here. It is discoverable, it is persuasive, shareable, monetizable, and scalable. So what do these mean? It means I need to stand over here to be in the picture. Uh, so on YouTube, people are actively searching for your expertise. So they're typing into the search bar and trying to find content that is going to address the issues that they have or for entertainment or just to be educated. And so you can potentially show up. You've probably heard this before. YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. 
and about 30% of all traffic that happens on YouTube is search. Other parts are the browse features. So you have the home page when you first log on to YouTube, you have suggested, then you have external. External is like maybe 10, 15% if that. And part of that is might be your website or Google, but YouTube search, it, it's a really important part. And if you're doing great on search, you're also going to do great on the other organic feeds like suggested and your homepage. Uh, these videos also show up in Google search. Um, so YouTube, or sorry, Google has recently shifted where it used to be individual boxes. Now they have a video carousel, which will actually show more than three videos. And so not all terms actually show video for those results, but terms like how to or cat videos, entertainment, uh, certain queries will bring up videos. And so you can kind of figure out what queries will bring up the video and potentially rank for that. Uh, so videos are persuasive. By using video, you can just convey so much more. So you can really increase that product desire. You can um, demonstrate trust by just allowing people, if, you're, if you are the representative of your brand, you can really uh, allow people to see more of you than they could in a blog post or an image. So that's, that's why we're big on video and YouTube in particular. It's, it, the, the best part about YouTube is that it is not feed-based, meaning that when you are on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, you are trying to stop someone in the feed. They're scrolling and you're trying to get their uh, attention, where if it's on YouTube, they might be seeking you out because they're searching for that. And they, when they click on your video, you have their attention. You can lose it, but you have them there. They, they don't need to scroll and then, and then they're gone. And so longer form content tends to work a lot better on YouTube. YouTube values long form content and we'll get into that. What is long form content? Good question. So the question was, what is long form content? So long form content uh, is relative to what platform you're on. Um, I would say long form on YouTube would range from seven minutes plus. Um, and there, people sometimes ask me like, what's the length of content I should put on YouTube? I'm gonna gear towards the longer uh, side of things like more than five minutes generally, um, unless it's an advertisement. But I wouldn't say there's an exact length. It's really how long you can keep people engaged for. But YouTube does value that because the longer videos um, you create and the greater audience retention you have, so the average percentage of the video watched, if you're keeping people for a long time, they can run more advertisements. So that's why they value it. And so if you can keep people engaged for longer than another video, they are going to promote that up higher in the search results. Uh, it is also monetizable. So my cooking show, uh, it is not a huge channel. I have about 50,000 subscribers, um, get about 200,000 monthly views. I think I've, I've kind of slacked. I've posted about 13 videos in the last, last year. So it's, it's older videos that continue to grow. This channel has paid my rent for the, every, for, for the whole year. Um, and it's based, it is actual passive income and I'm going to continue to build that, but it's, even if you have a business, it is an additional revenue stream. If you are a publisher, you might not want to market or um, sorry, you might not want to enable advertising on your videos because you don't want a competitor to monetize it. But if you are a publisher, you specialize in creating a lot of content or you're just getting in the millions of views, you can consider that you might want to actually enable monetization. Now you do have policies that YouTube's enabled. So you do need to become a YouTube partner. So that requires 1000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time. But uh, if, if you're making less than that in terms of viewership, then it's probably not gonna equate to much in terms of revenue regardless. Um, generally, even for large influencers, we see YouTube revenue is just a, a portion of it. You're gonna wanna look at other sources of revenue like selling a product um, or your service, whatever it is, sponsorships. Generally, for large creators, YouTube revenue is a portion of it. So it is also scalable. So what does that mean? So as I was saying, I have some older videos on the channel. And these videos, like three, four years old, some of these are generating 30,000 views a month. And so you can have content that you produced three years ago and it continues to grow. It shows up in the search results and that content can continue to generate you business. 
or earn you income through YouTube advertising. It also enables you to remarket people. So we'll get into that on the YouTube advertising side, but if someone has had a touch point with you on YouTube organically, then you can use the YouTube advertising to remarket to those people. And that's, I was saying earlier, that is the low hanging fruit in terms of advertising. It's people who are not cold, they've already experienced your brand, they've seen your face, they've watched a couple of videos. Those tend to have the highest return on ad spend. Um, so you can try and get where for every thousand dollars you spend on advertising, you're getting a four to one return on ad spend, four thousand dollars. And then ideally, um, because the audience sizes are so large, you can keep on funneling more of that revenue back. And these platforms are so big that it's very scalable in the sense that you can continue to um, reach new audiences through that. So let's talk about actually building a video strategy. So a couple key things that you want to look at. So I think with any strategy, uh, whether it's a marketing or a business, you want to start with your goals. What are you actually trying to achieve? If you know what your goals are, then it's going to be easier to figure out who you're reaching, what, um, what kind of content to create. So for goals, it might be that you are trying to be a YouTube creator that is monetizing through ads or it might be that you are a business that's trying to rank in the search results, or it might be all of those things. So you wanna consider what are your goals because that's gonna help you with figuring out what's your content. You wanna know who your target audience is because you wanna figure out what are they actually typing into the search results? What videos are they clicking? If you know who your target audience is, then it allows you to look at some of your competitors that might be in the space or people who aren't necessarily a direct competitor in terms of product, but they might be a direct competitor in terms of attention. So you can find out what captures the attention of, of your potential consumers where a, a brand is already doing that. You can see what, what people are actually engaged with and watching. Then we wanna establish our unique value proposition. So unique value proposition is what is going to separate you from all of the other channels on YouTube. So just as you have a unique value proposition for your business, what is going to separate your content from another's? Because there's so much, there's unlimited content. You can never go through, even if in a certain niche, there's unlimited content, like you, you could watch it for a lifetime in pretty much every niche. And so what's gonna make your content unique that you can capture the attention? And that, that's gonna be if you're presenting your personality, it could be that you have special access to information, it's that you are uh, humorous. So what are those um, unique traits that you can uh, include in your content and the strategy? Then we want to decide on the content type. And so content types, we look at it similar to how YouTube looks at it. So we have push, pull, and pow. So push content is content that you push out to existing audiences. It's like a series idea. It's something that you are feeding your audience content that they already want and love. Pull content is content that is known as evergreen. So it's content that someone might type into the search results or to Google and find you. You're pulling them in. This is my favorite content to do. I'm always doing like lots of keyword research before I start to figure out what are people typing into the search results that I can potentially show up for. Then we have POW. So POW content is content that you might do once a quarter, you invest a bigger budget into it, it might be an advertisement that you want to put um, bigger marketing dollars into. It might be a video you're trying to go viral, so you have a, a PR plan. So uh, these videos, they can, uh, they can be very costly, but they can have big impacts. Um, there are certain creators that are able to do POW content all of the time uh, and have a lot of success. One creator uh, would be Mr. Beast. This creator uh, has been on YouTube for a long time. Uh, young guy, and he uh, gets about 10 million views every video, and he does videos that cost a lot of money. Like he'll do videos that he will buy out um, entire stores, and or he'll do giveaways that cost in terms of like hundreds of thousands of dollars. But each video, he's basically using all of that revenue, um, and he does make a lot of revenue, like in tens of millions of dollars from his content, and basically injects it right back into his content. So he's an example of a creator who's doing like pow, 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 pow. Uh, this is a link here, Strategy Canvas. So we've created a free canvas. I was mentioning early the 
earlier, the business model canvas and value proposition canvas. So we were using this methodology to create this tool. I'll go back to it if you want to uh, write down the link, but this is kind of what the canvas looks like. This is an example, so it fills in. It's a little hard to see, but I'll just go over each of the points. So in the top left, we have goals, we have audience, unique value proposition, channel themes, uh, whatever that says under my face, I should know that. Uh, I think it's series, uh, series ideas, uh, distribution, so uh, where you're gonna distribute that content, resources, what existing resources you have or what resources you actually need. Uh, what are the unique qualities of your channel? So an example for mine, it's I sometimes inject humor, it's novel recipes, I'll bring on experts in their domains and we'll cook together. So those are some of the traits that I use. Where are you gonna promote the content? So while distribution might be like you're distributing to your YouTube channel or to your social platforms like Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, promotion is how are you gonna get people to actually see that? That might be your email list, that might be through paid advertising, might be through Reddit. That's actually where my channel had a lot of initial success. Reddit does have pretty strict self-promotion policies, so you have to be mindful of that, but it can be a great resource, not just for promoting content, um, but for actually figuring out what people are actually interested in. Uh, there are niches for every single type of, of niche um, and uh, known as subreddits, and so it can be a great resource just to find out what people are actually interested in that you can create content around. And then we have uh, collaborations. So who can you collaborate with? Maybe there's someone in uh, the, the space that already has a, a YouTube channel that you can potentially do a video with. Collaborations are one of the fastest ways to grow a channel. And uh, it, it doesn't just have to be someone who already has that influence. It could be someone that has uh, certain resources or you can provide value in a certain way to them, but uh, that, that will allow you to create something better than you could do on your own or something that uh, can reach more people than you you could do on your own or that the other person could do on their own. Uh, that's so oh, let's go back here. That's the link if you want it. Uh, bit.ly slash scratch canvas. So let's talk about optimizing YouTube content. So in optimizing content, you want to think of the important factors from the video side and then from the actual optimization of like metadata, so like titles and tags and descriptions. From optimizing the videos, so you want to um, keep people on your content for as long as you can. So we call this audience retention. It's the average percentage of a video watch. This is one of the most important factors for you to have success on YouTube and very likely the other platforms as well. YouTube really prioritizes this. Um, in when you are keeping people engaged, you are much more likely to rank higher in search results, suggested, et cetera. Now watch time, that is total minutes watched. And so in your analytics, you'll actually see watch time higher than viewership. Like it's, it's one of the first things you see. And so it displays it as minutes watched. And so when you have longer form content, if you're keeping people for longer than another, another creator, then YouTube's more likely to promote that ahead. And so if you can create that longer form content, you're more likely to have that success there. But don't just create it long because you want to, like don't add fluff to the content. Make it as long as you can keep people engaged for. Don't do a one minute intro because you might lose 40% of your audience unless that one minute intro is really hooking people and inspiring them to watch further. The great part about YouTube is you get audience retention graphs for each video, so you can actually see where your audience is most and least engaged. And so you can see if you lost 40% of your audience on a one minute intro, or you can see if people are interested in certain sections of your video where people will actually go back to watch a certain section, or maybe you say certain, certain things that just cause people to drop off. You get that data with YouTube and you can use that to craft better content. Then we want to look at the, was that a question? Is that analytics um, by the second of the video? So you can actually go to a particular second of your video and see the analytics and therefore get that sort of feedback? Yeah, so the question was, is uh, the audience retention graph, does it um, display by seconds? And yes, it, it does. So you can go to very specific sections and it will show you the video where you're at. And so you can see what you're saying. So with keyword research and optimization, 
you want to do this both before you create videos and once you have that videos. So before, the reason you're doing keyword research is to figure out how many monthly searches a video topic or a specific tag rather a keyword is getting because that will indicate how interesting um, or how many people are actually searching for that content because then you can create content that actually appeals to people and not creating content that no one's interested in. And so uh, when you are creating these, you can use a couple tools. We'll get into that. But uh, I saw you had a question. Yeah, go on. Question about tools? Okay. Um, so when you are actually, when you already have the video, we can use the keyword research for the titles, the tags, descriptions. We want to have a couple main keywords that we are trying to rank for. So first off, we have the title. When optimizing the title, uh, I look at two main things. It's clickability and searchability. Clickability meaning how inspiring is it to click on. It's not clickbait because you're not deceiving someone, but you are inspiring someone to take action. It's an interesting topic. You titled it in a way that's good copywriting. It inspires someone to click. On the searchability front, that means it includes one to two main keywords that, that you can potentially mm -hmm. rank for from your keyword research phase. If you're writing a title that doesn't have those keywords, it's still possible that you can get some viewership but it's going to be harder to rank um, for a specific term. Now, YouTube algorithms are getting smarter every day. Um, they, they take some tens of thousands of different data points. And so certain things like keywords used to be really valuable where you could put in something like Justin Bieber into the term and potentially rank because uh, YouTube would just show it. It's like, this is an interesting topic for people and you could potentially show up. Over the past like six years, um, potentially longer, it has shifted towards audience retention. So if you put in a keyword into your videos, um, there's specific video tag section, and YouTube sees that someone clicks on that, they watch the video, and it's not what they're looking for, they leave quickly, then that's gonna affect your rankings overall because YouTube sees that you've either tried to manipulate it or it's just not interesting to what they were actually looking for. So you're not achieving their goals of trying to serve content to people uh, that, that they wanna watch. Then we have um, the description. So the description, you want to think of like a mini blog post. You want to describe your content. What's it about? Here you can also include a couple main keywords. Um, you can include your links. So just write it naturally. You get a lot of space to do it. Um, so you're not going to be restricted by, by characters. But um, yeah, just try and describe what the content is about and include a link that's like a call to action, either to another video or to your website. Question the keyword then so they tell me that they go back through and like call their keywords after like looking at the data after the engagement is that valuable like going like let's say after a month here the engagement is good going through and like I'm gonna delete these words out of here and like I'm like is that worthwhile doing that? Mm -hmm. So the question was is it worthwhile to go and refresh and adjust keywords? So I would say that uh, it, it can be if it was poorly optimized or if you uh, are just noticing that the video is absolutely stagnant. Sure, it's worth, I would say that keywords are going to play a small role. What's more likely to do it is adjusting your title and thumbnail. Uh, those are going to have a bigger impact. Um, actually promoting it to new sources, um, those are going to have a bigger impact than, than the keywords. Uh, now, on the note of thumbnail, so thumbnail is one of the most important factors for um, getting viewership because that is the trailer of your video. So definitely when you are uploading a video, don't just rely on the three auto suggestions that YouTube's going to give you. You want to upload a custom thumbnail. So that is, I think, 1280 by 720 for, for size. So you are going to create a custom thumbnail that is inspiring for people to click on. It captures what your video is about. It intrigues people without giving everything away. You can include a couple main keywords on there. Might be high contrast, um, so it's not all one color. You might want to avoid certain colors that have that you see on YouTube, so things that are all white or red or black. Um, these aren't hard rules, but something to consider that you want it to stand out. And ideally, when people are scrolling through their feed, they know it's your content if they're interested in watching your content, um, either through your face or through your branding or through some consistency um, in, in those thumbnails. And over the past, uh, I think in the last year, YouTube has given us click-through rate. So that's a super valuable metric. 
especially for me that's like helping brands um, on YouTube, we get to see what's working, what's not. Click-through rate is looking at how many impressions you have and what's the percentage of people actually clicking through to watch it. So we'll get, we'll see the click-through rate of each different traffic source. So certain traffic sources are going to um, have higher click-through rates, but you get averages as well. And you can make informed decisions on how appealing either your content is or how appealing your thumbnail or title is. Because those are the three main things that they're seeing when making a decision to, to click. It's gonna be the thumb, what the content is, and the title. That's what they see when they're scrolling through the feed. Question. Yeah, um, so what would be a solution for um, a channel that has videos which are uh, shot on the on similar uh, camera angles? So, uh, so somebody, uh, my thumbnail ends up being the same for almost all the videos except for the, for the title. So, so the question was around if you are creating content and it's only one, one frame, how do you get a great thumbnail out of that? So the way to do that is by not relying on taking a screenshot from your videos. You want to actually take a photo that resonates what your, your video content is about. So you can do that through expressions. You can do that through props. Um, you want to take photos beforehand or after you record, um, but ideally not a screenshot. That is an option, but um, even when you're recording, you might want to consider actually um, doing something in the video if that's how you want to continue to do it. But I definitely recommend taking a photo. Okay, and then we have uh, call to action buttons. So these are ways to drive people to more videos, to subscribe, to uh, watch a playlist, uh, to go to your website if you're a YouTube partner. And so you definitely want to use these features. So we have cards and end screens. These to be annotations where you'd have these ugly boxes that some of them are clickable, some weren't. People can just put as many boxes as they want on YouTube. It's gone away in the last eight years, but um, end screens, this happened in the last five, four or five years. End screens appear in the last 20 seconds of your video. You can choose where in the last 20 seconds, but um, they, they're viewable boxes. It will actually show the thumbnail of the video or the playlist, or it'll have a little subscribe icon. So you definitely want to use these features because you want people watching more than one video. You want them going on to the next one because then that counts as session watch time. So that means their session doesn't just stop at one video, that session watch time continues on to more videos. This is um, okay. uh, and then we have cards. These appear in the top right of your videos, little I cards. And you can also, in addition to doing videos, playlists, you can also poll your audience. So you can ask them a question and have four different topics that uh, you can get some information from your audience or just get them to engage with you. Question, Ryan. Time screens last for 20 seconds? Uh, maximum 20 seconds. Maximum 20 seconds. Yeah. And so you are clicking on the video uh, where you want those and you can drag them around. You have a set space. Um, you can have it for five seconds. Um, but yeah, they're, they're a great feature. Do you rec have your recommended time? Uh, well, just don't impede, like don't, if your video, um, if you don't have a slate for the end screen, don't cover it up with, um, like don't cover your face with a clickable box. Yeah, so I kind of gear towards doing the full 20 seconds, but make sure that the last 20 seconds, you are not covering your face. Because if I give this an example, um, I could use right here as a spot for showing it right here, but I wouldn't necessarily want to have it right there. But if I'm a full talking head on the screen, I don't want to put it over my face uh, entirely. Um, so you want to consider what's that ending. And so you can have a specific end screen slate. that might be a call to action that you can use for all the videos. It might be designed to include certain links, that you can include certain boxes, like play next video and have like a little arrow to it. So you can make a custom end screen slate for your videos. Question. Um, so are you saying that if you haven't posted your first video yet, that it's probably wiser to do many uploads in the beginning at first? So the question was, should you, um, if, if you've only have one piece of content, should you um, add more videos onto your YouTube time. channel at the same time before, um, before you start going on YouTube? I would say, um, yeah, you could start with, with a couple. I wouldn't worry about um, batching it out, um, like where you have 20 videos and, and releasing it all at once. Mm -hmm. um, but having a couple where people can go on, I think that's fair to put a couple uh, videos on. In the beginning, 
that's going to be the toughest part. Like YouTube is a long-term game. Um, it, it's not like you can't just expect to go on YouTube and get viral. Um, it, it does require consistency and putting out consistent content. So I, I'd recommend if you are going to uh, go that route that you do have some videos in the pipeline. If you know it takes you three weeks to a month to produce one video, then yeah, get yourself a bit of, a bit of runway so that when you do start producing videos and putting them on YouTube, you have time for, for next ones or just a backlog of videos that you can post out. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't recommend dumping out like 30 videos in one day? I would not recommend dumping out 30 videos in a day unless there's a specific um, strategy that that makes sense. Yeah, like, just what, what are competitors still saying? It just says about well, 300 or so, whatever views, it does like 100 or 200 times what the normal one is. Yeah, I mean, if you're putting out 30 a day, that's great. But if you're putting out 30 and then you're waiting two months to put another 30, that's not ideal. Yeah. Uh, so captions. So captions are your subtitles. It's also the information that YouTube pulls uh, to take a bit of metadata from that. And so you can caption your videos, you can not, um, but it will, it has been shown to increase watch time. There's a stat that says 12%. I don't know how accurate that is anymore, but YouTube does pull some metadata from those subtitles. It's also good for the hard of hearing. And the best part about when you caption your uh, videos is that once you have those captions, you can use that for a blog post or you can take that, uh, those subtitles hard coded onto uh, like your LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram because most people on those feeds or a lot of people on those feeds don't watch with sound and so you're going to want to hard code those uh, those subtitles onto those and you can use those as like highly shareable videos to either promote people uh, promote your YouTube channel or promote your website so if you are doing that uh, shareable social video on one of those social channels it might be a one minute video that covers one point of your top five tips that you're then driving them to watch that full video. Okay, so these are some of the good and bad things to do and don't for titles. So uh, don't be vague, uh, be specific in what the, what the content's about, unless you're a huge influencer and someone's gonna just watch your content regardless. These are not hard rules. Again, uh, there's best practices. Uh, include a couple search terms, um, avoid really long wrote long words that nobody's actually uh, typing in, um, but also use interesting verbs and adjectives. So don't use best, uh, don't use awesome, um, and use something that's gonna just describe it that people still would type in. Again, it's hard rule. You might see that someone is typing in like best um, burrito recipe or something, and, and that's actually a search result that people type in. But I think uh, for inspiring clicks, you're gonna be better off if having a very descriptive adjective uh, when, when you're titling your content. So here are some of the research tools. So we have vidIQ. Who here is using vidIQ? Cool, two. Okay, so you all should use it if you're on YouTube. It's free Chrome extension and it will allow you to see what, um, what keywords you have that are ranking. So when you go on a video, it will show you where it is ranking in uh, on YouTube. It will also show you uh, what competitors are using, so you can see what terms they're, they're using in their content. You can also type in a search term and it will give you scores and it will show you a competitor analysis. So it will show you how many people are searching and what's the competition of how many people are using those tags. And it will give you a score. So you're basically trying to find stuff that has high volume of search, low competition. And so it's a great free tool. We pay for the premium version, it just gives us a lot more a lot more terms and, and data, but uh, I definitely recommend the, the free one to start off with. Then we have the Google search bar and YouTube search bar. So both of these have auto suggest features. So you can start off with one of those terms and uh, you're gonna get an auto suggest of what people are actually typing in, the most commonly asked questions or most commonly inputted phrases of what people are searching for. So it might inspire something or give you an idea of how to craft a title um, you can also actually enter that in on, say, Google and look up what blog post people are interested for that specific keyword or phrase. And that there might not be any video content that covers that that you could potentially do that for. Is that a question? <laughs> uh, then we have Google Keyword Planner. So Google Keyword Planner is a tool through Google Ads. So this tool has been around probably more than a decade. Um, but Google Keyword Planner allows you to see monthly search terms 
what the volume is in specific locations. And so it will also give you um, clicks. So it will show you uh, what the cost per click is for that. And so if you see a click that has a very high value, that is an indicator that um, that click is actually bringing people business because it's a bidding platform. So a lawyer, they can afford to pay more um, for a click than someone that is selling a $2 product because they, uh, yeah, they have a high value product. And so it is a bidding system. And so ideally you're bidding um, uh, effectively where if you're using the ad platform, where your product has a better, uh, a better return or you have better margins or something, or you're just not competing with someone who can spend more to acquire a customer. Um, that's on the ads front. Now, if you are a uh, creator creating content organically, then you can create content that is valuable for um, someone to pay for. You see that someone's spending $20 per click. If you can rank organically for that search term, then you know that is a profitable keyword for someone because they are, they are earning income from that. And so usually those keywords that are higher value is going to be, uh, so it might not just be like lawyer, it would be um, uh, a specific term around that, like injury lawyer or um, a specific sub term that uh, someone, it's an indicator that someone is ready to buy. And that's probably the best part about um, Google ads is, is generally people are typing in terms to, to figure out um, either how something works or to learn about a product. And that's why Google ads has been so successful, but you can use this free tool to apply it to your YouTube marketing and potentially get really valuable traffic for free or paid. There's also a, um, on the YouTube advertising front, you can target based on keywords as well. Uh, this is what vidIQ looks like. So this is for an Apple video. It's actually a weird example because it has, um, they put in really random terms here. Most of their traffic on this video, I'm going to assume is um, paid media, but they're a huge brand that can get a lot of organic traffic and people are just naturally interested in this content. But they have things in here like um, fence, restaurant, secret, protect. So uh, someone is drunk or high maybe when they put this in or using a weird system, but uh, uh, you can see what terms are actually ranking, what they're ranking for. So this is a free tool uh, that we've created. It is a video topic generator. And so if you go to that link, that's really small, bit.ly slash video video topics, or email me after and I'll, I'll send it to you. It will, it's basically a Google spreadsheet and you type in the term. Uh, so like enterprise planning is the one example, and it's going to give you over 200 different video titles. I wouldn't necessarily recommend using the exact title that it's uh, giving you, um, but you're going to get lots of ideas regardless. You can input that keyword that from the keyword research phase and see what, what comes up for that. Uh, so uh, an example, uh, it's hard to read on the screen, but uh, eight undeniable reasons to love enterprise planning or 10 startups that'll change en the enterprise planning industry for the better. Um, so you can use it uh, to at least give you a framework to find more ideas. Question? Are these all from your website, like seriallyvideo.com, you can find all these tools? Uh, not this one. The other one, I do have a resources section, uh, but this one, not yet. Yeah. And I, I'm not currently setting up spam. Maybe in the future, but if you download the resources, no spam yet. Just because we're slacking on our email marketing. <laughs> Uh, so the elements of a video that performs well. So click-through rate, we talked a bit about that. So you get that data. That is going to indicate that people are interested in your content, interested in the topic. So you want to have a high click-through rate. We have audience retention. That was the average percentage of a video watch. We have watch time. That's total minutes watched. So longer form content typically does better on YouTube. We have engagement. So engagement is going to be likes, shares, comments. Now certain things of these are more um, manipulable, um, but you can uh, like buy likes on Fiverr. It's not gonna help you, it'll probably actually hurt you over, over anything, um, but you can buy fake, fake comments even. Um, I definitely wouldn't recommend it, but um, so they, they play different roles in, in um, how valuable Google or YouTube um, uh, values these these points of, of interest. So for engagement, again, 
shares, comments, likes. If you're, if you're getting people to comment on your videos that are organic, that means they're coming back to your content that they might be uh, talking to you or to another person. Um, that means that audience retention might be increasing because then they might be replaying that video as it's just playing in the background while they're typing. Um, and and it's, it's a building a community. So the comments are probably, um, people ask for likes on YouTube um, or try and hit certain targets and it's, it's not really a great data point. So, um, so if you're gonna make a call to action, make it to subscribe or comment or to watch more videos. Uh, not to, to like your content necessarily, unless you're trying to do some fun thing where you're like, if we hit 5,000 likes on this video, I'm going to do a somersault off of my roof. So uh, yeah, don't, don't try and get likes. It's, it's a vanity metric. Uh, early signals. So early signals are an indicator to YouTube that this content is valuable at this point. So in that first week of releasing, it's going to have a little new tab. And while that content is new, YouTube is testing that out. How engaged are people? What's the audience retention? Is it getting shared out? Are people coming from external sources? So you want to promote your content right when, you, right when you're releasing it. Don't let it just kind of pass and promote it. Oh, I'm just going to promote this a week later. Um, you want to get viewership to it early on while it's still in that new phase. That's going to, indicate, that's going to help you in the long term. And again, not a hard rule. You might see that you got no viewership and then YouTube starts testing it out after a while um, or just sees that it has great audience retention and might start trickling and then you'll see a spike and then all of a sudden it's gone, gone viral. That, that happens. Um, but overall, if you can get early traffic, that's gonna be a good indicator that your video is, is more likely to perform long-term. You had a question? Yeah, um, so uh, would you say a good idea to um, comment on a um, uh, video that is similar to your video and think that, okay, hey, I've done something similar to this. Uh, you want to come check out the feedback. So is that considered as spam according to YouTube or um, how is it with that? So the question was, is it valuable to comment on other creators um, if, it's, if it's not spam or is that spam? I would say that it is valuable to comment on similar creators. You're going to put yourself in front of, uh, in front of them, in front of the audience. What you don't want to do is actually make it spam. So if you are commenting, provide value, try and create a relationship, add insight, but don't just like spam your subscribe or don't put links in there because then nobody's even going to see it. Um, definitely don't use like swear words. I don't know why you would, but um, then it's just going to automatically be filtered. Um, but yeah, it's definitely valuable to engage, especially if you want to create a collaboration and if someone's seeing you comment on every video, like I, I know the people that comment on my videos um, every time and I've never met these people, but I, I can still like name some of these people that um, are just a, a, a fan. Yeah. In, sure. a, in a comment, can you put in a, a URL or an email address? So the question was, can you put in a, a URL or email address into a comment? You can put that into your own um, and that will show up on, on your own videos. If you put that on someone else's, they're gonna to have to approve that. Otherwise it's filtered or it'll go to spam. If you do the same thing to, um, to multiple channels, it'll automatically get triggered as spam. Uh, so I, I wouldn't recommend that unless someone is asking for the link and um, even then you, it, it might automatically go to spam. Yeah. Then we have tastemakers. So tastemakers, uh, we would consider this as influencers or blogs or Reddit. These are external sources where um, it, traffic is coming from or from another YouTube channel or a video that you did a, a, a collaboration with the creator. These are indicators to, to YouTube, especially if you're starting sessions from an external source, they're coming on to watch your, your content. That's going to be a great indicator that, that people are interested in this content and they value it because you are starting new sessions. You're getting people onto their platform. And so, uh, like I was saying with Reddit, I've got a lot of traffic. I've been featured um, creator on Huffington Post. That's probably a lot of uh, a lot of traffic as well. So those tastemakers are definitely going to be valuable and good indicators um, for your content. Just as if you're getting your website shared from um, high traffic or high um, what's the term high value domains, then uh, your website or, or posts or articles are going to do higher up in the search results. Any questions about the YouTube uh, marketing side of things? 
organic? Um, the relation between um, Instagram Live, like the Instagram Live or Insta TV and um, YouTube. So the question was, what is their relationship uh, between YouTube Live, or sorry, Instagram, Instagram Live, Live and YouTube? Yeah, so the, the correlation and whether you can appear on with engagement, because the Instagram Live engagement affects the YouTube viewership. Is there any relation? Uh, because they're separate platforms, not really, unless you are um, promoting. So yeah, YouTube Live that has a closer relation, but um, Instagram Live, uh, unless you are doing uh, content to promote uh, your videos on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, I don't see what that correlation is. If you have a big audience on external platform, like on a social platform, yeah. then yeah, that, that can definitely benefit your, your YouTube channel. Right, so, so there's no inside machinery between the two. No, because they're okay. separate companies. Okay. Um, between Instagram and Facebook, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's a stronger correlation there, but between Instagram and, and YouTube, not so much. Okay. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you uh, uh, efficiently direct traffic from Instagram to your YouTube? So, um, I usually have a video on YouTube and I try to promote it via Instagram. So, uh, even to add, but I end up having more likes and traffic on my Instagram and they don't get converted to, I mean, they don't direct to your YouTube page. So the question was how to drive people from Instagram to your YouTube videos. So you have a couple options there. You have Instagram Live, you have your stories, and you have uh, your normal posts. Um, so posts, you can't link there, but you can still tell people about it. But it's going to be harder to inspire someone to go onto YouTube type in your video or that URL. You can send people to the bio. Um, that is probably the most common practice for, for posts where you have a link to the bio or you're using a third party tool that allows you to have multiple links in there. Um, Instagram stories is, is probably gonna be your best option. But again, if you don't have, what is it, 10,000 um, followers, then uh, you, you can't actually link. So again, you're gonna be verbally directing people, compelling them to watch. I'd say inspire them before you've actually released the video, and then once you release, follow up with another uh, comment that you that you're putting this video out, and give them a preview or a clip. But yeah, it, it's it's going to be a lot harder to convert that traffic over versus say an email list. If you have an email list, that's that's going to have a higher click-through rate. It's just easier to engage, and someone's already clicked on that email to to learn more. Okay, uh, YouTube advertising. How are we doing for time? Have another 10, 25 minutes. Okay, cool. <coughs> so, has anyone done YouTube advertising? Yeah, cool. Okay, one. Okay, well, I'll try not to overwhelm you because uh, I, I took out some slides that got a bit into the weeds here uh, when I do like a workshop, but um, we'll, we'll cover the most important factors or some of the, the key things that you might want to learn that might inspire you to want to run YouTube ads. Um, but we think it's it's one of the best platforms for direct response selling, especially if you're doing remarketing and you have you built up an organic audience. It's great for um, running ads to those people. Um, and we'll show you some of the ways that you can target target people. So the the struggle that uh, people consider with um, when when running ads is that um, as Facebook ad platform has become more saturated, it's become more expensive for brands to get a great return on investment. Um, YouTube, it is, it wasn't, um, it wasn't as ideal for uh, performance marketing, meaning that you're trying to get a direct conversion or transaction. It's great for brand awareness, and so you have big brands on there that were basically moving their TV budgets to YouTube. Um, but now, the um, in terms of getting a conversion and actually having them that all tracked, it, it's it's a lot stronger of an option now. Uh, so you might have limited organic reach. You can only reach so many people. As a business, you've probably noticed that a lot of these platforms have kind of shifted to a pay-to-play model, meaning that if you want to get seen, especially on Facebook, and, and you're a business, you're going to reach a very small percentage of them organically, and so you have to pay to reach them. But with, with YouTube ads, you can have that organic traffic, and then you can also pay, pay for that traffic. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend that if you are a creator and not business, meaning you don't have a product to sell and you're trying to make YouTube advertising revenue, that's gonna be more challenging um, unless you are trying to hit certain targets 
or you're trying to have certain credibility or um, you are trying to um, get your video to have greater watch time and show up higher in the, the search results. That's where I'd say um, where YouTube can be valuable. YouTube ads can be valuable on the on paid media side. Um, you, people think that YouTube ads are expensive. Uh, you can pay a, a penny per view uh, for, for what you're reaching. Um, it can go up to up to like 15, 20 cents. Um, but on average, like when we're running campaigns, usually we're seeing in like the four to seven cent per, per view range. And so that, that's pretty good. Uh, if we look at influencer marketing, um, which is also something that we, um, we manage, we'll do influencer marketing campaigns and for like a specific brand, uh, we'll see, okay, for every, um, uh, we'll, we'll look at the cost of what an influencer uh, sends us, what their package is, and then we will look at um, what the average uh, viewership they have on the last four videos. And we'll look, okay, well, what's the actual cost per view? Because some people will just look at the subscribers, that subscribers are not relevant because that doesn't indicate how many people are actually gonna see that content. And so we look at it at cost per view. So anything under 22 cents for this hair care brand that we're working with, that was that generally led to a return on investment of at least two to one, meaning that uh, generate $2,000 uh, from of revenue if the influencer costs a thousand dollars and that's all tracked through promo codes and Shopify um, but so you can see where YouTube ads it's a bit cheaper in terms of the cost per view or CPM cost per thousand views great question so the question was what counts as a view so a view with YouTube ads is you have to watch at least 30 seconds yeah so you don't pay if someone doesn't watch 30 seconds um, unless it is a bumper ad, um, so it's a short format, like 15 seconds or six seconds, um, then it's a different pay model. It's pay per thousand, thousand, thousand views, what, regardless. Yeah, but they can't skip it. Yeah, where YouTube ads for in-stream, after five seconds, they have the option to, to skip, unless it's a non-skippable ad, which many people find pretty obtrusive, but uh, they, they can work. So some stats about YouTube ads. So there's over 1 billion monthly users on the YouTube platform that you could potentially reach, um, 5 billion video views per day, uh, 80 plus countries, 70 plus languages. It's the world's largest video platform. Uh, it allows for immersive user experience. So you have both the organic side, you have the paid media side, you have 360 videos, you have, um, click, click through story videos. So meaning um, it's like an adventure. Um, what are those choose your own adventure type videos? Um, it, it just has a lot of um, a lot of functions. There's gaming uh, channels. There's there's kids kids series. So there there's so many different ways to reach different segments of people. So we're Twitch being bigger than YouTube now. Twitch being bigger than YouTube. Yeah, for more viewers per month than YouTube. I have not heard that. Yeah. Oh. That's 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 six months ago. Wow. Huh. I'll have to look that. Interesting. What's Twitch? What's Twitch? Uh, it's a live streaming platform originally, I think, created for it's mostly gamers. Yeah. But yeah, huge, huge platform where creators make a lot of income uh, on there because people are actively donating on streams. People will spend like 10 hours on a, on a stream doing content. Um, okay, so some other things. So it is valuable for the reach. People are actively searching for information, entertainment, um, inspiration you can be that video content. And so when you're creating video ads, you don't just want to sell your product, you might want to actually provide value in that content uh, to people because you might be interrupting them. They might go to watch one video and then there you show up as an advertisement. But if you're providing them value, they might be intrigued to stay and learn more. And then you can potentially bring in your product or introduce them to your service. Uh, and the lasso allows you to target people the moment in that they're in um, in need of your potential product, either through they're typing in a keyword or they're looking at a specific video, how to do something, that's where you can get them right at the ideal point of where they can potentially become a customer. Uh, so why is it great for engagement? So videos, they engage the brain. Um, you're able to provide more value to these customers and create a relationship with these customers because um, if you don't have that trust and relationship, they're, they're less likely to buy from you if it's like your the first time seeing you and so that's where YouTube and YouTube ads really allow you to tap back into people that you've already had a touch point with or or starting that first touch point and then they go on to subscribe to your channel 
and watch watch more content. Uh, so viewers who watched ads for 30 seconds or longer were 23 times more likely to subscribe to the channel, watch more videos uh, by the brand, or share the video. So pretty pretty significant, and uh, that's that's an advertisement. So I uh, could this is a stat by Google, so take it with a grain of salt. Now the ROI. So many advertisers they've shied away from YouTube, but as I said earlier, you can get viewers for as low as one cent per view. Uh, so it's it's really not costly to test it out. Um, or just to promote a video because you want more people to see it and want to get some feedback of how engaging that is. So that's where it can be a great way to just test, to test out your content and advertisements. So this is an example of brand we work with, really small metrics, but um, this is a sale, this is on Shopify, so it's sales by traffic, um, where it's being referred in terms of social sources. So uh, at the top here, uh, we have YouTube with $176,000 in sales. Uh, this is for their year to date. Um, Instagram, 162,000. Uh, Facebook, 80,000. So before we started working with this brand, they didn't have any uh, YouTube revenue aside from uh, random creators that would go on and review the product. It was pretty minimal. Um, and a big part of this was the influencer marketing. Uh, so we'd find creators to create content. And then we would use that content not only to leverage their audience, they have a natural like trust and authority with their audience, but we would take that content and use it as advertisements. And that had some of the best effects for, for, for ads. Like those were some of the highest return on investments because these creators, they address these important points. Like they're able to hook the audience because they, they already have some authority. They're an influencer. They go through what the problems were. So in this case, it's a natural hair care product that we're running uh, called Briogeo. It's a company out in New York. And these creators, they have problems. They have struggles with their hair. Um, and then they, they address that, they talk about that. Then they go through the solution, which ends up being the product and how that product worked for them. And so it's like an ingrained testimonial, but then we introduce like a, a call to action uh, onto that video to drive people to actually learn more about the product. And so those ads work really well. Uh, so the persuasion. So videos allow you to really demonstrate your product, show it off, use um, testimonials or work with influencers to show how it's used. Uh, it allows you to increase that product desire and trust and trigger emotions for purchase. Um, people often will make purchases based on their emotions. So if you can tap into that, you can uh, potentially uh, make, make sales from that. So final thing, if a picture is worth a thousand words, how much do you think a video is worth 1.8 million. Hey, you got it. You're so fast. <laughs> yeah, they, they did the math. Easy on these clickers. Um, sorry. So just, Question. just the point of, uh, yeah. Would you? What do you suggest first? Building the brand and then looking to work with um, to affiliate yourself with different brands. Or if you already have, so I have 18.4 thousand followers on Instagram, right? So if I'm going to start my YouTube channel, would it be smarter to approach brands and look for affiliation before, like from the word go with my YouTube channel or, or I mean the YouTube channel, or does it make sense to launch, build a viewership base and then approach brands? Yeah, so the question was, does it make sense to approach brands before you start putting out content yeah. or vice versa? Or vice versa. So I would say start with the content. Mm -hmm. um, unless you're, you have a relationship, an existing relationship with the brand that you can get a sponsorship, it's going to be a lot harder for anyone to do a, uh, a sponsorship if you don't have an audience right. on that platform. Um, now, there's going to be exceptions. Like if, if you have a friend that is a creator on the platform, then yeah, that, that's going to be uh, have more an effect, especially if, if you're um, just trying to grow your audience mm -hmm. um, by finding a creator that's in a similar niche that you have a relationship with. That's where you're more likely to get more traffic. But for a brand to pay for that, it's no, no, they're no. they're paying for that yeah. influence and how many people that they can reach so as well as content. Is, so there is a chance with sponsorship if you approach. So if I approach different brands and said. I'm just starting out and I, I want to like a symbiotic relationship of sorts. Um, would that be something? It's going to be harder for brands to justify it because brands are looking for a return on investment. Right. You could approach it if you are a 
a creator that can make amazing content mm -hmm. and you're packaging it in because you have an Instagram audience and say, you know what, I'm also going to create a YouTube video uh, to start things off and maybe they will reciprocate by sharing that out or something like that. Right. But yeah, brands are looking for a return on investment. So if, if, if it's going to be harder for them to justify that if, if there's not people that they're actually oh, reaching, sorry. if it's just for the production of the right. content. Okay. Yeah. So 90% of users say that product videos are helpful in the decision making process. Mm -hmm. So let's look at YouTube ad campaigns. So these are some of the different uh, types of YouTube ads. So we have a YouTube masthead. Uh, this used to cost like $100,000 just to have it on the, the top of YouTube, whether it was the desktop or mobile. So pretty exclusive. They've kind of opened it up where you can pay on a per view or per CPM. Um, then we have Google Preferred. So these are on creators that are approved by Google. Google has um, made sure that this content is, is appropriate for, for advertisers. Then we have bumper ads. So these are six second videos. So we're doing a six second video. You're not trying to fit everything in. You're trying to get one key point or one key message as an advertisement. We have TrueView in-stream. Uh, that is, uh, the, that's the ad that you see the most. It's the skippable ad or non-skippable where it uh, shows up before a video. And then we have display advertising. Those will show up in um, when you do a search at the top of the search result, or it will appear in suggested videos. Um, now these videos, display ads, they don't actually click to a website. Someone is clicking to watch those videos. And so depending on your goals, if it's more around brand awareness and just growing audience as a creator, that one might make more sense because you're driving people to your YouTube videos and not to a website. So the, the content with that, we, we just have a channel right now for ours, and now we're you're saying about ha having to have a website to be able to point everybody to that website, but we kind of want everybody to be on the channel watching the videos, and not just about being like, do I invest the time of building the website to make it like scroll and like put all the blog posts on it, to help people maybe find a Google search for the website via, instead of finding it on YouTube, what that correlation like that, that, that's what I'm trying to figure out is it worth my time spending you know, hundred dollars on the website. Mm. So the question was, uh, is it worth the time in investing into a website to help grow the YouTube channel? And just you know, and we had like this website forever, but I didn't have one. We just have the YouTube channel period. That's it. Yeah. So it depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to sell products, then you're you're going to need a platform to, to sell them. Um, if you are a writer and you want to create blog posts, you're going to need a platform to do that, unless you use something like Medium. But um, yeah, so it depends kind of what your what your goals are and, and how much you want to invest. But if you have limited resources, um, and, and that's that's not the stage that you're looking to do. I focus on creating creating great content and building that audience. Because um, yeah, if you're trying to get sponsorships like snowboarding um, brands as like partners. Then they're gonna have kind of blog solar brands and then it just changed our like what if they give me snowboard and I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Right? They get tested over that stuff. That happens. Um, so you can you can say that it's gonna be an honest review, and generally, yeah, you're gonna have to um, be upfront, but the creators really value that. So it's it's kind of you gotta decide what what side you're gonna what side you're gonna lean or if you're gonna go right down the middle and just be yeah, we have to be objective and be like, hey, I didn't like this board, but I can see this customer liking it. That's the, the take we've been taking on it. Yeah, I think that would that would make sense. Yeah, and I, I imagine that these brands are gonna trust trust their product too, that uh, it's gonna work for you. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this is what an example of one looks like. Uh, so this is true for action. So when you're bidding um, on a cost per acquisition, so you're bidding, for, say you want. Uh, I can acquire a customer for $70, and so you put that in, and YouTube's going to try and hit that. When you bid on, a, call that CPA bidding, you get uh, some additional, just these tiny buttons. Um, YouTube doesn't give you a lot to, to click on in terms of uh, what that uh, what that button looks like, so that's where you're often directing people in the advertisement where to click. Um, you can also use end screens if you want to drive them to other videos, um, but in terms of um, the buttons, yeah, you can see what they give you. So any of that in that banner there is clickable. Uh, so some best practices. So when you are running a campaign, you want to make sure that you are using uh, actual tracking. And this only matters if you are trying to track 
purchases or, or leads, so email leads. But just like Facebook or any good ad platform, you're going to get a piece of code that you can put onto your website that allows you to track that. So, um, and, and that might be tracking specific button clicks, or you are giving them, say, a free ebook that you're directing people to. And then when they go onto uh, your page and they download the ebook, that's going to say take them to a thank you page. What that thank you page is going to do, that's going to indicate that this was a conversion. This generated you X amount of dollars, or this was just valuable. And so that's how that information goes back. And so you're going to have to set that up. Some brands, it can be a lot more intricate. It's like we're working with the creator that has about six different domains, and all of them have uh, Infusionsoft, like payment in between. And so you'd have multiple redirects, and it just got super, uh, super challenging. And these are, there's a tool, this might be in the weeds, but Google Tag Manager that allows you to just put all of your tags onto Google Tag Manager, and then you just have Google Tag Manager onto your, onto your website. Question? Five minutes, that's not a question. Okay, uh, best practices, you always want to test and optimize. So you're going to get data back and you're going to want to use that data to um, either turn certain ads off or invest more in, in a certain campaign. And so it's, all, it's always about split testing. Once you turn certain things off or you have a return on investment in certain campaigns, you want to scale that up. You want to put more budget. You don't want to leave money on the table if you're generating a return on investment. So for targeting, so this is a little graphic that YouTube's given us. So it has the different types of, of targeting. So at the top, we have demographics. So demographics are going to be your gender, age, location. Uh, the, these basically all ad campaigns are going to have that, that layer. Then below that, we have the different types. And it kind of moves people into a cold to hot audience. That's kind of how it works. Like at the top, it says top of funnel, then we have lower funnel. So at the top, we might have people who have never heard of you. So affinities, uh, that's going to be more on a specific topic or interest that um, uh, Google Ads or YouTube Ads, um, YouTube Ads are run on the Google Ads platform, uh, that they've indicated that uh, a person fits that, that profile. Um, but it might be the first time seeing it. Um, as we move down, we have like in-market. That's something where uh, people are actively searching for product. Google has identified that. And so that might cost more, but uh, more likely to return uh, on an ad spend there. Uh, remarketing is obviously our favorite. People have had a touch point. Uh, so you can remarket based on if someone's been to your YouTube channel, watch a specific video, watch an advertisement, or if they've subscribed to your channel, um, or if they've watched five videos in a row, or you can do it if they've been on your website. You can do it if they've added a product to the cart, um, but then maybe didn't go on a purchase. So they've, they've, it's, it's your low hanging fruit. Then we have customer match. Um, you need to spend at least $30,000 uh, in the ad platform to get access to that. But what that is, is you are linking your emails, um, uh, basically you can link emails to Google and, and show that um, this email uh, was a conversion. And so they're gonna find similar people that match that, or they're gonna retarget. You can retarget people who have already been uh, either a lead or a customer. But unfortunately, YouTube has restricted that in the past year. Uh, this is another graph of looking at that. So moving someone from a uh, window shopper to a checkout. So again, we have uh, remarketing at the end, in market. Uh, in the middle, we have search. So that's keywords. So people typing in keywords. Uh, placements. So these are specific channels and videos. So you can actually choose where you want to um, target people and uh, not not everyone, you can, like some, some brands or creators, it's going to be more expensive because people are bidding more for it. Um, and then topics, so uh, people are watching videos of specific topics, so you can potentially show up there, and then uh, the more cold audiences. So here, we already talked about this, but different ways you can remarket. So what I haven't talked about, let's see, likes, um, people who have been, just visited your channel page, maybe didn't subscribe. Um, and very specific pages. So maybe if you are a service-based company and you saw someone has went to a specific case study, then you might want to get in front of them again because they're, they're showing interest in, in your product. So um, yeah, you, you can get very granular in how you remarket people. Uh, this is a graph that you can't see, um, but it is a, uh, one is a remarketing campaign. This campaign we've run in the past, uh, 
three weeks, uh, or just finished it, September 12th to 23rd, 2019, uh, that campaign had a 10 times return on ad spend, uh, that 10.09. So that one, um, it's for, I should say, uh, who, but I want to, um, it's for Eckhart Tolle. He's a big kind of um, spiritual guru per se, um, but uh, he wrote The Power of Now and New Earth. He's got like 700,000 subscribers. And so that's where uh, we built up this channel organically, but then we're able to remarket um, with, with the program, which is a valuable program, remarketing that to people who already had a touch point with, with Eckhart. Uh, and then we have um, just different lead generation campaigns. So this, this campaign uh, here, it shows cost 20,000 and conversion value 91,000, but um, uh, in reality, it was like a, a four and a half return on ad spend. So I think it was like 33,000 and 136,000, something, something like that in, in sales. And largely it's, it's remarketing. And that was in a, a one month campaign. Uh, these are what the ads actually look like when you're um, when you're looking at the ad section. So you get data like viewership, view rate, average cost per view. So we're looking at eight cents for each, what the cost is, how many earned views. So that means they've watched other videos. Uh, it shows you conversions. Conversions can be transactions or leads. Um, you can segment it out and see which which are which. Uh, cost per conversion. So I believe these ones were for um, email leads. So for every email, it cost us a dollar, a dollar oh six. Um, so I had like a four uh, percent conversion rate, and so it could be a good way to build your email list. But we were using that to be able to um, we had an email marketing campaign that we could then sell sell products uh, on it. So whether you're trying to go for that direct purchase or trying to build up your leads, it's uh, either way can work really well. Uh, yeah, here's here's an example of that. Uh, oh, this is another campaign, but um, this is uh, for that hair care company. Um, so you can kind of see uh, what that return on ad spend is and how valuable these platforms are uh, when, when you get a good return on ad spend. So in terms of optimizing it, so what you can do is um, if you see a rising cost per view, it may mean that you have shown your video to the same person too many times. It's known as ad fatigue. So they're, they're just not, not as likely to purchase or you're just paying more. So you might want to uh, bring new content into the play or uh, target new audiences. Uh, low click-through rate means that your call to action might not be compelling enough. Um, uh, you're gonna wanna split test different ad copies and the landing pages that you're gonna go to. Um, so these are all different ways uh, that, you can, that you can optimize the campaigns once they're already existing. I don't wanna get too in the weeds here, but if you have questions after. Uh, and then the content. So we'll go through this last point quickly because uh, I know we're uh, running from time but um, so this is the video ad conversion formula that um, is, is often used in video sales letters and uh, we like to use this formula for ads it's not uh, again it's not a hard rule but this framework can be really powerful so we'll kind of go through so in the beginning you want to hook you want to capture the attention of the audience because you are trying to get them to watch more of that video and so you want to hook them um, by compelling them with a interesting statistic or a, um, uh, a fun fact that they're going to learn or your top three uh, pieces of information that they can get. You want to hook them up right off the bat. Then we have the problem. We want to address the pain point that the viewer is having. Then we have solution. What is the solution that uh, you are addressing for further pain point? Then we have uh, social proof. So how are you building credibility? Again, with the influencer part, that brings in that natural credibility. But uh, you can introduce like testimonial videos really quickly into that, or you can say who you have affiliations with or awards. Uh, but you want to do that so that you build some of that trust. And then we have uh, call to action. So you want to compel them to actually take an action. You don't just want to um, show them all this cool stuff and then don't direct them to anywhere. And then we have uh, direct them to a, a landing page that is very specific to what they just learned or read about. It's not just sending them to say a home page. It's, it's pretty relevant to what they what they just watched. Uh, do we have time for this? How long is it? Three minutes. Well, <clears throat> if we do, we're going to be finished at five to nine. I promised you to be gone at nine. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, who's here seeing this? Okay, two people. You're in for a treat if it happens. Oh, 
Oh, are you not on internet? We are. Sound? No sound? Okay, so we can't watch it, but that's okay. Uh, I should figure that. Squatty Potty. So this ad um, basically put this company on the map. It's very ridiculous, as you can see just from that thumbnail, but it is this guy talking about a, a pooping unicorn that basically has struggles because uh, when you are not using their product, a squatty potty, or have your legs up, your sphincter is actually restricted. <laughs> and so you are not pooping most effectively. And so it's this ridiculous video. Obviously they have the hook with how humor this is. They just, they address the problem. They show uh, all of this, um, they show the, the stats, they show uh, the research, they show the credibility, how many five-star reviews they have on Amazon. And so it's a really great advertisement. And this, this one video, um, it got a ton of organic press. So this is that POW video where they invested a lot into it. And then they used it as an advertisement and they were basically able to put this company on, on the map. Uh, and then some best practices, use a prop to create a pattern interrupt. Um, so that would be an example of a, a prop, something that's gonna capture their attention, address who you're actually speaking to, um, you want to make sure that it's fast paced. Um, you don't want to lose their attention. So make sure cuts are super on point. Uh, sometimes refer to these as jump cuts where you don't even leave seconds to, to breathe in between. You're basically cutting um, as much as you can out of it. So you're only hearing dialogue or something visually appealing to see or you're changing angles, camera angles. You want to make sure you have that going for you and provide value in the ads. That video is actually quite informative. Uh, so I definitely recommend checking that out today. And that's all I got. Marlon, thank you. I thought I knew a little bit about video. Now I realize how little I do know. <laughs> Got questions? Uh, and uh, finally, I need to thank Ion Connect. Uh, you've made this reproduction possible.